Hello everyone. Welcome to AISC's Night School, Stability Design of Steel Structures, Applying Modern Methods of Structural Analysis, presented by Donald W. White and Ronald D. Zemian. Today is February 23rd, 2015, and this is Session 4, Second Order Elastic Analysis, Getting It Right. Tonight's presentation will be presented by Donald W. White. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker, Donald W. White. Dr. White is a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology in the School of Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Dr. White's research covers a broad area of design and behavior of steel and composite steel concrete structures as well as computational mechanics, methods of nonlinear analysis, and applications to design. Dr. White is a member of AISC's Committee on Specifications and has served as chair for several committees for the Structural Stability Research Council. Dr. White has received several awards throughout his career. In 2005, he received a Special Achievement Award from AISC. In 2006, he was awarded the Shortridge Hardesty Award from ASCE. In 2009, he received AISC's T.R. Higgins Lectureship Award, and in 2010, ASCE awarded him with the Raymond C. Reese Prize for his research and development activities in the area of stability analysis and design. Very pleased to have Dr. White presenting this evening. Don, thanks for being here. I'm going to hand things over to you. Okay, thanks, Brett. And hi to everybody from Georgia Tech, where uh, I guess you could say our motto is better wet than frozen. This is session four. Let's see if I can get it to advance there. Okay. And so we're going to be focusing on second order elastic analysis tonight and issues in terms of getting the analysis right. Uh, many thanks to Ron for sessions one through three. Uh, here's a basic, basic map of where we're going. Uh, we've got six main parts to the session. Uh, we'll start looking at some basic and not so basic considerations pertaining to P small delta effects in topics one through three, uh, including where a general purpose second order analysis may be a wise option. Uh, then we'll review uh, some very important fundamentals of P large delta amplification and look how the basic uh, AISC B1 and B2 amplifiers can be used in ways that maximize their usefulness. And then we'll wrap up topic six, uh, where we'll look at some important accuracy considerations uh, when using general purpose second order analysis methods. Uh, much of the background to the presentation comes from AISC design guides 25 and 28, so I'll refer you to those documents. Uh, 25 was actually written a little later than 28, and so, uh, so there's a little bit more detail in there about some of the things I'll be talking about. Uh, so let's get started with a review of the essential basic equations for P-small delta amplification. A key attribute of second order analysis that Ron's already emphasized is that equilibrium is considered on the reflected geometry in the structure. So if we take the most basic case of a simply supported beam column subjected to equal and opposite end moments here, uh, causing uniform primary or first order internal bending moment. The second order effect uh, is the extra moment from the axial load acting through the, uh, the small delta deflection relative to the chord here. So M first plus P times delta second. Now, um, uh, the amplifier that you see at the top on delta first is actually a fairly accurate amplifier. Uh, for this particular case, uh, we're within 3% accuracy even if we're pushing it really close to the Euler buckling load. Uh, notice also there's a red uh, equation number on the side there. So if, when you see the equation numbers come up in the slides as we're moving along, these are equation references to AISC. That's the equation for PE1 in Appendix 8 of AISC. And also, uh, if you've looked through your, your slides, uh, basically there's uh, various definition slides sc scattered throughout to help you if you're coming back to try to sort out some of the things we're talking about. So let's uh, 
basically just uh, use that amplifier and write down our fundamental equation, m second and equals m first plus uh, p delta second. And then after a little bit of algebra, we can get that down to the basic B1 amplifier times m first that we all uh, know and love. Uh, that's shown there at the, here at the bottom of the screen. So if we carry these equations forward, uh, we can uh, uh, basically show the C sub M amplifier. Uh, uh, that simplifies to this form, typically. So equation in the commentary to appendix 8. Uh, if we go through the calculation of the psi value here, uh, the psi for this problem actually turns out to be equal to positive 0.23. Uh, now, that may be a little bit puzzling to some because uh, actually the IIC specification and pretty much any of the other worldwide standards when we're looking at this problem, we generally take psi equal to zero. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, if we compare to the theoretical uh, solution as shown here by the secant equation, uh, at a target of about 70% of the oil load, we could be in error of about 15%. Now, are we going to worry about that? Uh, generally not, because uh, it's hard to apply moments to the end of a member like this without creating some incidental rotational restraint that uh, would help us out a bit as well. So we'll kind of write it off that way and say, OK, we're going to go with cycle zero here. How about some other cases? Well, uh, simply supported transverse loads within the member, uh, the deflection amplifier I showed you, the basic uh, description, fundamental M second is M first plus P delta second. They still work well, uh, at least as long as we're talking about symmetrical loading, where the maximum internal moment and the maximum internal deflection are at the same location. And so if we go through the same process that I just showed you for the uniform bending case here, uh, we get uh, cycle 0 and cycles minus 0.2 for these uh, two loading cases on this slide. Uh, what about uh, if we look at uh, cases that would be indeterminate, uh, fixed, fixed, or a prop cantilever beam? Well, in this case, the same form still uh, is work, works very well, except we're going to uh, modify the PE1 uh, equation to the general form that's given in Appendix 8, which includes a K factor here, K1, for non-sway. Uh, K1 generally less than 1 if we've got any kind of infixity. So um, with that done, we've, we're doing pretty good. And the only problem is that uh, it's not readily derivable like we just did with the simply supported cases. In this case, we can uh, basically uh, generate the analytical solutions from a stability textbook and then do a calibration to them. And so you, the K factors and the psi values that you see here at the bottom of the screen are generally pretty good for those cases. Uh, what about uh, more general in restrained members? Well, if, if we're uh, transversely loaded and you've got moment connections to other framings or flexible supports, generally what you're going to find is as you vary the axial load level, the psi value jumps around quite a bit. And so forget trying to write down a constant psi value. Uh, generally speaking, a practical thing to do here is just take C sub M equals to 1. That can be conservative in a lot of cases, but in a lot of cases the amplification is small anyway, and so we don't uh, really stress it. Uh, and so the equations uh, would be the equations you see at the bottom of the screen here. Now, how about the simply supported case where we have uh, uh, in loaded members unequal in moments? Again, uh, to review this one, the uh, amplifier for B1 is ex still the C sub M over 1 minus P over PE1. In this case, uh, we get a value for the amplifier less than 1 in many practical situations. And so then fundamentally what that means is that basically the larger of the applied end moments, M2, is actually the maximum second order moment in the beam. Now, in this case, uh, a C sub M factor that's been around for quite a while in many different uh, references is uh, 0.6 minus 0.4 M1 over M2 here. And uh, the AISC commentary gives a couple of plots that show how this works. It generally tends to be conservative uh, for uh, reverse curvature bending cases when we have high axial load, but uh, we 
I have the same issue that I discussed earlier for the uniform bending case as we're approaching single curvature and uniform bending, we could theoretically be off by as much as 15% on conservative uh, as we approach a high level, our target, kind of for upper bound uh, 0.7 for P over P1. Well, uh, what about the general case with inloaded members, no internal transverse loads, but um, uh, we're moments connecting, say, to other framing? Uh, well, uh, given the member's maximum first order end moment, M2, uh, we can basically just use the uh, same form I just showed you, but uh, we bring the K1 factor in, K1 less than or equal to 1 again, and uh, generally things uh, work pretty well with that. I'll just show you an example uh, in here in just a second. But uh, the major point that I'd like to get at here with this is that uh, uh, generally, there's much more to the second order interactions between adjacent members than these equations imply. And so that brings us to topic 4.2, where I'd like us to explore that uh, issue a bit. So here's a, uh, a basic L-shaped frame uh, that uh, I'm adapting from the book by Chen and Liu. Uh, both members have length L, and both have the same rigidity EI star. Uh, if we look at just a solution where, uh, say, the axial force in the column is negligible, and so if we really just have a first order elastic solution, we get the moments that you see here in this inset view with p equals zero. But uh, if we take uh, basically the axial force in the column being approximately equal to p, so let's say we apply w first, and then we're going to uh, increase p and look at what happens. Uh, what uh, we'll notice that happens is that the moment at the knee of this frame starts decreasing as we apply axial compression to the column. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, the, uh, it's kind of the inverse of the Apano string problem. The column is becoming more and more flexible as it gets increasing axial compression. And in fact, as we get to uh, the level where P is equal to PL, pi squared EI star over L squared, uh, what we actually will see is that the moment at the knee of the frame has decreased to zero, uh, which is kind of an interesting case. We may have designed that beam, uh, assuming some end restraint for the column, and that restraint's not there anymore. The moment in the beam, the maximum moment is W L squared over eight. And if we keep uh, loading further, uh, say we had a situation where that column is a light column, where we were trying to maybe minimize the footprint somewhere, and we're designing that column for k less than 1. Well, the beam has to restrain the end of the column, uh, or restrain the buckling rot rotations at the end of that column. And so that means the maximum moments within the beam can actually be larger than WL squared over 8. Uh, we can understand uh, what I'm showing you with these moment diagrams a little bit better, maybe, by looking at a, uh, a plot. And so let's uh, consider some of the curves here in the plot. The, horizontal axis, P over PEL, and then moment normalized to W squared over 8 on the vertical axis. Uh, starting with the dashed blue curve, uh, the dashed blue curve shows the internal moment at the knee, and so you can see it's generally decreasing as we're increasing the axial load level, as I uh, explained in the, in the moment diagram plots. Uh, how about the uh, maximum moment in the column? Well, that's shown by the solid red curve. And so that maximum moment actually decreases and is at the top of the column for a bit, but then it starts becoming maximum within the length of the column and then starts taking off as we get a higher and higher axial load. Now, uh, the dotted black line shows what we get from the B1 times M first at the knee uh, that we were just talking about in the earlier topic. Uh, if we calculate a, an effective length factor for this uh, frame, 0.839, uh, and use that, uh, it's, you can see it, it pretty much nails it in terms of the red curve there as we're getting out to high axial load. It's a little bit conservative for low axial load where the moment in the column actually decreased. What we might be a little more concerned about, though, is that is the uh, beam moment uh, and so at p equals zero, we're basically starting out with what we assumed, which was about, I think, about 0.76 of WL squared over 8. That's just a first-order solution. 
and you can see the green dash curve, that moment is increasing as we get higher and higher axial load in the column. And generally, the uh, B1 amplifier that we use member by member doesn't have any prayer of catching, catching this. And uh, uh, if we look, say, for example, at uh, a state where B1 in the column is 1.2, uh, we've actually got an amplification of that moment of the beam of 13%. So uh, it's not a small amount that we could be off in terms of those moments. Well, it's for this reason that the commentary to the AISC basically suggests that for moment frames where B1 is greater than 1.2 in members that have a significant effect on what's going on in the structure, it's probably a good idea to think about starting to use a rigorous or a general purpose second order analysis. We'll talk about how do we go about that here in a minute? And uh, the reasons for that are, are elaborated here on the screen, but I've already told you those, so this is just here for your uh, posterity's sake. All right, well, let's look at one other last topic with P-small delta amplification. And that's a kind of a more general issue of, of using general purpose second order analysis in calculating element internal moments. And so uh, let's suppose that we are doing a general purpose analysis. We've got accurate second order element in nodal moments and nodal rotations, as we'll discuss subsequently, uh, and how to, how to get those. And so, uh, so let's say the second order maximum moment is as shown here on the moment diagram that goes along with this. And this is an element length script L. Um, we could generally be using, say, uh, multiple elements to represent a given member if uh, we need, based on what we'll talk about later. So the problem here is that, okay, we've got accurate nodal results, but what about calculating what's going on between the nodes? Uh, well, what happens, uh, unfortunately, in a lot of programs, they don't give any consideration to P small delta between the nodes. And so uh, it's just a first order calculation between the nodes, and we're going to lose out on some accuracy of the solution if we uh, don't account for what's going on there. Uh, well, the simplest thing to do manually is basically to use the equations that we walked through in topic 4.1, uh, but we're going to use them at the element level, so script L, and uh, we'll use K1 equals 1, just as an, a conservative approximation. Uh, this is going to tend to be uh, conservative in a lot of situations, but uh, again, if we have a situation where the P small delta amplification at the element level is relatively small anyway, then we can be highly conservative and the overall error isn't substantial. Again, a reminder with the table uh, CA81, uh, that's based on ideal boundary conditions. And I remember what I told you back in topic 4.1 that uh, once we go to general boundary conditions, uh, uh, those constant psi values don't re really work so well anymore. Uh, this slide is more for the software providers. That's if we're writing software and we're going to calculate what's going on between the nodes. Uh, the first thing is that we may need to make sure our users have enough elements to ensure accuracy of the second order nodal moments. The um, other I think then moving on from there, uh, there's literally, you can come up with 20 different ways to do the calculations, but uh, a way that we've seen works very well, and we found we get the best accuracy with this, is first uh, uh, calculate the, the small delta first values, basically not can just work out what you get from a first order approximation at several positions along the element length. Uh, but you're going to do that by isolating on the element, and you're taking the second order nodal rotations relative to the core that you're getting from your global analysis, plus any applied in element internal effects. Uh, well, we're going to need to sample here in this case, and so we'll sample a close enough spacing so such that uh, axial load over PES, where PES is pi squared EI over the spacing S squared, is less than a 0.02. Uh, from here, then, uh, we'll calculate an amplifier, 1 over 1 minus P over 4 PEL. Uh, the 4 here confuses a lot of people. Essentially, what uh, we're doing in this case is taking K1 equals 0.5 now, because we've already applied a nodal in rotation, and then you can think of we're locking the nodes down. 
And so the nodes are fixed, and now we're get, then getting a second order amplification based on a fixed fixed in condition for the element. Uh, and then once you have that delta second, just follow the fundamentals that we looked at in the earlier slides. You get your, your base first order moment in naught. You add the P times delta second to that at each of the sampling points, and then look for where's your maximum values. And uh, what we found is that this approach uh, uh, gives uh, basically within target 3% uh, unconservative error for uh, all the cases that we can throw at it. All right, well, let's move on to P-large delta amplification. In this case, one of the major uh, points that we need to, oh, Brent, Sorry, we'll stop here and we'll take some questions. I'm just rolling right along, but uh, that's okay. just give yeah, a lot for uh, questions. Let's, uh, let's take a couple questions here. Um, can you just repeat, uh, if you go back, some of your slides you have in the upper right, you have, uh, You've got red equations in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the slides. Can you repeat where those are coming from? Okay, so wherever you see a red equation on the right-hand margin, if you have your AISC specification handy, if you go to, uh, in, th in this case, the topic 4.1, Appendix 8, and you look at th those are the equation number references in Appendix 8. Okay. All right. All right, we'll move on. Um, we'll take questions and again uh, at the, uh, the next convenient break. Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. Tom. Thanks. Okay. So let's uh, look at p delta, p large delta. So uh, an essential characteristic of looking at p large delta or side sway effects is overall first order side sway stiffness of the stories in a building frame. So the simplest way to kind of get our heads around that. Uh, is to look at a basic cantilever column. And so here for a cantilever column, you, see, you can see that uh, the story stiffness, we're going to write it in a, in a way that may be uh, under, uh, maybe a little uh, unfamiliar. Uh, we're going to do uh, the story shear, H, divided by the drift ratio, that, which is the, the deflection due to H, divided by the story height, L. So then for a cantilever column, that would be 3 EI star over L squared. Now EI star, I've referenced that a few times. Uh, that's basically a reduced fractal rigidity if we're looking at the direct analysis method, which we'll talk about uh, next week, or it's the nominal rigidity EI if we're using the effective length method. Okay, well let's uh, look at calculating drift ratio, and let's look at a uh, kind of the most basic building frame we could create out of this. Let's suppose that we've got gravity load that's supported on uh, leaning columns, or we often call gravity columns, that aren't participating in the lateral load resisting system. That's represented by the column on the left here. And if we just look at equilibrium here on that uh, leaning column, we're going to need a P delta shear of P1 times delta second over L uh, in order to uh, keep that column in equilibrium in the deflected configuration. And uh, if we look at what that's doing to our cantilever column, it, we're adding that shear to the column and also increasing the uh, moment at the base of the column by P1 times delta second. That's our sideway amplification effect here. Now to put this in LRFD or ASD terms, uh, we'll suppose that H and P1 are, are uh, either factored LRFD or ASD loadings. Uh, we'd call P1 then our alpha P story, where uh, we need to be looking at a strength level in ASD. 1.6 is a factor that takes us from working load level up to the um, uh, strength level uh, that we need to look at for uh, uh, our second order effects. Uh, if we're in LRFD, we're already at strength level, and so uh, alpha is equal to 1. All right, I'm going to take you through algebraic hell here just a little bit. Uh, there's really not time for me to step you through all the details of the algebraic equations, but uh, all we're going to do here is now say, well, let's try to write delta second. Well, the shear is H plus alpha P story times delta second over L. Uh, our stiffness in terms of delta is 3I star over L cubed. And so from there, let's just run with it. And then after we work through 
a bit of algebra, we're going to end up with, well, the second order drift ratio, delta second over L, is the first order drift ratio times a basic amplifier, 1 over 1 minus alpha P story over PL story. Now uh, we can take this a little bit further and recognize that, uh, well, when we get buckling, uh, let's say we're okay at design load level, but what if we scaled up alpha P story by a factor we'll call gamma story? Uh, and if we kept scaling it up, scaling it up at some point uh, we'd have an issue where the amplifier would become unbounded, uh, and that basically is the definition of buckling. And so uh, if we uh, have gamma story times alpha P story equal to PL story, we have 1 minus 1 in the denominator of the uh, amplification factor there. And so uh, that defines buckling, or gamma story, the uh, multiple of the loading that would take us from our design load, alpha P story, up to the theoretical buckling load here in this case, PL story, is um, uh, is uh, PL story over alpha P story is gamma story. Uh, the nice thing about uh, bringing in that variable is we can write a simplified or kind of a simpler looking amplification factor equation of just one over one minus uh, one over gamma P story uh, for uh, our uh, calculations uh, that we move forward with. Well, uh, we also generally want to get the side sway moments. Uh, so that's our HL plus P1 times delta second here. Uh, we'll take these equations forward that we just used, and we'll just in, then start writing out more algebra. And if we carry that through, uh, amazing. We get uh, the second order moment at the bottom of this cantilever column which is representative of the general overall side sway moments in a frame, is our first order moment times 1 over 1 minus 1 over uh, uh, gamma P story, or gamma story. All right, well, uh, generally we also have gravity load that's supported by the lateral load resisting members of the frame. And so uh, let's look at a, a representation of that. We'll take the same idealized uh, structure that we were just looking at, but now we're going to put a load P2 on the lateral load resisting column. Uh, now let's focus in on that lateral load resisting column. We'll just isolate on that so we see this free body diagram. And if we uh, look at uh, moments uh, that are in that particular column, uh, one thing we have is that's shown by the dark gray and the light gray moment diagram here. Uh, those two moment diagrams are basically what we had in the previous uh, version of this building. But uh, now we have an additional moment that's shown by the white shaded part of the moment diagram. And that's the moment of P times small delta, where small delta is coming from the bending curvature of the member that makes the axis of the member be at a different location in the cord between the member ends. Now, what's the deal with that? Well. If we've got a small delta there, we've got some extra moment, P time, P2 times small delta. Extra moment means we have extra curvature in the column. Extra curvature means we're going to have a larger lateral displacement uh, in our story. And so uh, more algebraic hell. We're going to make an assumption for delta that actually is a very accurate assumption in the limit of uh, the, the uh, approaching the buckling load of the story. And uh, if we then carry everything through, this is really just moment area equations here, but uh, looking to calculate a second order side sway deflection. Uh, we keep running with this, and ultimately we can get down to the equations you see in the bottom right of the screen, uh, where it's the same as what we had before, but uh, we're going to estimate this extra effect, which was this P small delta moment increasing the, the drift or the large delta of the frame by a variable that we call R sub capital M. And R sub capital M is just a very gross approximation, but generally it's a relatively small effect, so gross approximations are okay. And that approximation is 1 minus 0.15 of PMF uh, over P story where um, PMF over P story, that's basically uh, the PMF is the 
uh, axial load supported by the moment frame columns uh, and uh, P story uh, would be the total uh, axial load supported by the story. So in our example here, P2 would it PMF would be P2, P story would be P1 plus P2. Uh, so RMF generally varies between one if we've got something like the first case we were looking at with no force on the moment frame columns uh, to uh, 0.85 if everything in the in the uh, frame is a moment frame column. All right, well, let's take those uh, equations based on looking at displacements forward. And uh, so now ref more references to Appendix 8. Uh, these uh, equations are basically the B2 equations, and R sub M is, goes along with the B2 equation in Appendix 8 of AISC. Uh, we, want, uh, we can do, say the same thing about when does buckling occur. We got a small reduction on the buckling load of R sub M times PL story. Uh, again, our gamma story would be R sub M PL story over alpha P story. And uh, uh, again, our, we could write in simple form once we have our gamma story, the amplifier is simply 1 over 1 minus 1 over gamma story. All right, well, let's uh, take that into our equation uh, for the second order moment, uh, HL plus alpha P story times delta second here. And uh, so again, more uh, messy algebra, and we can get this down to the form that you see in the lower right now, uh, where uh, what you can see in the numerator of this equation, uh, of, the, of the ratio there, this is an amplifier. The uh, term Rm minus 1, that's kind of like the psi term that we were looking at with C sub m and the p-small delta amplifier earlier. And what this is telling you, since Rm is generally less than or equal to 1, uh, is that uh, actually the side sway moment amplification is generally smaller than the side sway displacement amplification within a building story. Now, what do we do about that? Well, it's not usually a big difference. And so in Appendix 8 of AISC, we use the approximation that uh, we're just going to use the displacement amplification factor for everything. And so that uh, gives us a little bit of a conservatism generally with getting the amplification of the second order side sway moments on top of the conservatism that we already have with R sub M. Now lastly, let's talk about uh, effective length factors. And uh, what, we have, what, we've, what I've just shown you is a fairly general derivation that uh, works on story stiffness and can nicely account for all kinds of effects, such as panel zone deformations, if those are important, member shear deformations, et cetera. It's all in there. And so uh, uh, using uh, what the der derivation we just did, it's very convenient to say, OK, what are our column effective length factors, and accounting for all those different types of effects. Well, the fundamental relationship for getting that is what you see here on this slide. And even though there's literally hundreds of ways of calculating effective length factors in the literature, everything comes down to this equation. Uh, that is, the axial load is simply at incipient buckling is equal to pi squared EI over K2L squared if we're looking uh, at side sway effective length factors. Let's solve that for K2. And so this is a general equation for K2 that would work for any method. But let's uh, use the method we've just derived. We'll take our gamma story and substitute in. And so this uh, gives us this expression for K2, which we can simplify down to the form in yellow here now. And this is very close to the equation uh, CA75 in the commentary to Appendix uh, 7 of the uh, specification. Uh, it's the slight difference is, was basically an oversight where some changes in the way we write the factors uh, still occur in 2010. I think this will be updated, and you'll see it exactly in this form in 2016. Now, uh, uh, Bill LeMessure actually originally uh, developed this type of approach, and uh, he basically recognized that uh, you could get K2 values if you have a very light column subjected to heavy axial load, where the rest of the moment frame is restraining that column in side sway. So K2 could be less than 1. 
but the uh, resolution on the equations uh, starts to lose uh, accuracy uh, when we get into that realm. And so what Bill did was he developed a limit, this um, limit that I've added here to the equation that basically keeps you out of trouble. Uh, so you can calculate using this equation a K2 less than 1. Uh, if you have a situation like that, uh, that could help you out with a really light column, say a column turned in weak axis bending, where other columns are in major axis bending, uh, or uh, an acceptable approximation that many prefer is just used to use K2 uh, equal to uh, uh, great, equal to one as a lower bound on what we would do with the K2 equation here. Uh, just a note, uh, if you've got a leaning column, like the right-hand column we were just looking at in our example that's not contributing to side sway resistance, then it's independent of the rest of the frame, so K is equal to 1 for any leaning column. Also, we'll talk about it more next week, but K is equal to 1 in the direct analysis method or in, in the DM. Okay, so let's uh, look at applying uh, these methods. Uh, basically are B1 and B2, and how can we uh, make the best use out of them in general. I want to show you uh, several different methods. Uh, and So the methods are summarized here on this slide, but we'll look at the details of each of the methods in the slides that follow. Uh, now to explore uh, the details of these methods, I'd like us to uh, uh, look at uh, a frame that Bill a measure uh, used in his 1977 seminal paper that was the kind of the start of a lot of the uh, uh, equations we use in Appendix A. Uh, this is a frame that uh, Bill referred to as a market shed frame. Uh, it has a storefront on the right-hand side, and so it has very light uh, HSS columns there that we're idealizing as being leaning columns. And the lateral load resisting system is made up of the W8 by 48 column on the left and the W30 by 99 girder. Now let's uh, suppose we're going to use the direct analysis method. And so for this frame, that would involve a stiffness reduction of 0.8E on all elastic stiffness contributions. And so we'll go forward with that. Uh, again, more about the direct analysis method next week. Uh, and we'll also assume that. Um, uh, side sway amplification is less than 1.7 here with the direct analysis method, uh, basically allowing us to be able to do the analysis of this frame without needing to consider initial out of plumbness effects. And more about that next week also. So let's look at the uh, Appendix 8 AISC NTLT analysis. It stands for No Translation Lateral Translation. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to take our structure, which generally we might analyze in the way you see here, but uh, we're going to split our first order analysis into two parts. Uh, the first part being the NT, or no translation analysis, where at each level of the frame, we're going to provide a lateral, an artificial lateral restraint. Uh, and uh, so you can see we have a reaction here in this particular case of 9.08 kips here in the, for this uh, structure that's preventing side sway in this frame. This frame being highly unsymmetric has a tremendous amount of side sway under the gravity loads if we don't restrain it. Now uh, the next step in the NTLT method is we, we're going to do a lateral translation or LT analysis where we'll take the reverse of the artificial reactions at each level of the frame and add those with any lateral loads that are coming in at each level. And then we analyze the frame for the sum of those two lateral loadings. Now we're going to need our, our B1 and B2 factors here, so let's uh, work on that. Uh, this frame, either we could use the wind load and, and get the the delta H under the wind load, but uh, we'll just write it out as uh, unit load. Uh, the frame would uh, deflect uh, laterally by 0.269 uh, with stiffness reduction included here uh, if we uh, subjected it to unit load in a first order analysis. And so if we do our story stiffness, again, H divided by a drift ratio, delta H over L, that's 535. Uh, kips, oops, typo here, 
This should be kips per radian, not kips per inch. I've seen that before, and I forgot to change it. Okay. Uh, then alpha p story. We just uh, do a total gravity load takedown here. So 4.05 uh, kips per foot times 40 feet, 162 kips uh, being supported by our structure here. Now the R sub m factor that we talked about earlier. Uh, here in this uh, frame, we've essentially got half the gravity load supported by the leaning column, which is not a moment frame column, and half of the uh, gravity load that's supported by the moment frame column on the left. And so that gives us an R sub m of 0.925. Uh, we go to our B2 equation. Uh, we get 1.49 in our B2 equation uh, from uh, these terms. Let's do our B1 amplification. And so in this case, uh, sides to a frame like this, generally I'm going to just take K1 equals 1 because I know I'm going to end up with a B1 equals 1 anyway. Uh, now notice that I'm using a 0.8E in the PE1 equation. That's because this is part of the structural analysis, and I'm doing my analysis with, with reduced stiffnesses here. We take that uh, PE1. Uh, we combine that with a C sub M for this case that's 0.6 since we have zero moment at the base. Uh, we get 0.62 for B1, but B1 is never taken less than 1. Uh, we, so B1 is equal to 1 here, basically meaning uh, we're essentially confirming what, uh, if you look at the deflections, we would already expect. Uh, the maximum second order moment in our column is at the top of the column. Okay, so we're ready to put everything together with the NTLT procedure. So in this case, let's um, uh, take our NT moments. We're going to multiply those by B1. And so I have a, a negative moment of 109 that goes with 1.0 for B1. Then we have our side sway moment that we got from our, the sum of our horizontal load plus our, the reverse of our NT reaction. Uh, the B2 was 1.49, so we got a 113 foot kip moment estimate. If we go to mass stand and fire it up and just model this frame out, right out, we get 104. Uh, from an accurate analysis with a sufficient number of elements in Mastan. Not too shabby. Uh, if we look at the moment of the beam midspan, uh, 862 foot kips uh, was the exact answer, 866. Okay, so good enough. Well, uh, as many of you may well know, uh, doing the separate NTLT analyses and artificially restraining uh, the lateral movement of a structure can kind of be a pain in the neck uh, in some situations. And so it's uh, often preferred to try to do something simpler or simplified uh, and not uh, bother with all that. So there's a procedure that's in Section 2 of the AISC manual that basically suggests that um, uh, we're going to uh, uh, that procedure basically suggests multiplying the, max, the, the total first order moment by B2. I'm modifying it here and say, okay, take the maximum B1 or B2, just to make it more general, and, uh, and we'll get our estimate of the second order moment that way. Well, that's only 60 foot kips. The exact moment, as I showed you earlier, is 104. Not so good here. Another often used estimate is basically to take our first order gravity load analysis results. Uh, and so for this particular frame, uh, you see it's, there's, a, there's zero moment in the column because we've only got one lateral load resisting column here. Uh, if we uh, look at the lateral load results, okay, here's our lateral load analysis. And so a uh, convenient procedure that works very well if we don't have any significant side sway under gravity load, it basically the loading and the structure are symmetric, or approximately so, uh, becomes grossly an error now with something like this frame where we've got substantial side sway under gravity load. Again, same answer as before, so we're way off. All right, uh, this brings us to my favorite method, but I'm a little bit biased. Uh, I call this the amplified story drift method. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to analyze the frame first order analysis for the total loading that we want to assess. 
and we get our first order side sway amplification, or first order side sway displacement, 3.35 inches here in this case. Uh, now let's uh, get our B2. We already calculated that. Let's apply that to the side sway amplification, or to the side sway deflection. And so uh, that'll that'll give us uh, 4.99 inches here. And now from here, let's just look at well, what's the p large delta shear force that would give us the second order moment side sway moment effects with that? Well, that's alpha p story times delta second over L, so 5.62 kips. Let's take that force associated with delta second, and we're going to apply that to a, a another first order analysis. This second analysis gives us the second order moments in the frame, as well as any second order axial forces for that matter. We add those together. Uh, we get the moment diagrams you see at the bottom here. 107 foot kips is as the maximum moment at the top of the column. In this case, we are, are going to use a, a, a another gross approximation again. We'll basically say, okay, we need to kind of cover our bases for any potential P small delta amplification. So we're going to amplify the total moment in the column by B1. But B1 is often equal to 1 anyway for a frame like this. Uh, 107 versus 104, pretty good. In fact, this is the best results of the various cases that we can look at. It's also arguably uh, more uh, straightforward to get all the different forces, beam moments, et cetera, in the structure by this uh, type of approach. And 864 in the girder versus 862. Well, uh, one thing you could say is that, well, wait a minute. All that's kind of a lot of manipulation. Why don't we just uh, run a general purpose second order analysis? And that option is certainly available for a lot of software now. Uh, so that's a good thing to do. Uh, however, for preliminary design, or when we're just trying to get a handle on, wait a minute, what am I seeing here? What kind of uh, 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 intensity of second order effects are we getting? Well, we, we could do a, a general purpose analysis, first order and second order, and compare the displacements. But uh, the B1 and B2 equations basically allow us to, to get a manual estimate that we could use to kind of figure out where we are in general. Now, uh, lastly, uh, if we are going to use the uh, B1 and B2 factors in a general three-dimensional analysis, uh, we've got a little work, more work to do. Uh, we need to generally select orthogonal x and y directions, which, of course, could change as we move up the building in a multi-story building. Uh, we apply separate B2 values. B2 capital X, B2 capital Y for each story and in each direction of lateral translation. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for B2Y. Uh, uh, now, notice that B2 capital X and B2 capital Y are associated with the global axes, so they're completely unrelated to the direction of bending of the individual members, that you can see here in my example are uh, in various uh, directions that are different than capital X and capital Y. And so what the, this means then, if we have load effects in the capital X direction, they could cause both major axis and minor axis bending in a particular member. And so B2 capital X then applies to both the major axis and the minor axis moments that are caused by loading in the capital X direction. Uh, now, once we get to the member level, we're going to need to apply B1 values, uh, B1 little x, B1 little y. Now, these are associated with the uh, major and minor axis of bending in the members. And so B1 little x is that cap applicable to the major axis bending. The same thing for B1 little y. OK, Brent, uh, I don't know if any questions have come in, but this might be a good place to stop and, and uh, try to clear up anything if there are any. Yeah, we do uh, have a few questions here, Don. So let's try to address those now. Uh, we're going to move back just a little bit. Can you go to slide 24, please? Oops, not slide four. OK. OK, um, someone's just asking for clarification. You mentioned the internal moment at the knee. Can you just clarify where that is located? 
So uh, can, is my uh, pointer, uh, my mouse pointer, visible on the screen? Yes. Okay. So that I'm pointing at the, the knee right there. It's at the corner of the frame. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I apologize. I don't have a slide reference for you, but you had mentioned using a reduced stiffness. Um, mm -hmm. And mentioned you get more into that with the direct analysis method. But one question that came in is: it you, is it reasonable to use 1.0 times e if the factored axial and moment demands are below 0.5 fy? Uh, no, uh, generally it's you know definitely once the once the second order effects become small, then uh, everything kind of reduces back to you're getting first order results for everything. So you could make that argument. Uh, so yes, in the general sense, uh, the specification doesn't really go there. Uh, there are lots of other caveats that we'll talk about next week. Uh, where we can say, well, if you got this, then do that. If you got that, then do this, and so forth. But uh, that's not one of the caveats the specification currently recognizes. OK. Um, next question. You mentioned that you can use a k equal to 1 for leaning columns. And the question is, is that independent of what the end condition is? Uh -huh. If it's a leaning column, uh, then uh, basically uh, that type of member, we're assuming that uh, it's not participating in the lateral load resistance. And uh, a lot of times when we run the structural analysis of the frame and we include those members in there, uh, we're going to pin each end of the member in the structural analysis. Or you could have something like the, um, the, the small HSS section in the measures market shed frame that I showed you. Uh, that uh, you could say maybe that's uh, got a connection uh, to the girder that may transfer some moment, but that column is so light that uh, uh, you're you're really not going to get much action there anyway. So we'll just model that as a leaning column for practical purposes. Okay. Um, let's go to slide 49. So the question is in regards to um, your drift. You show at the top of, of delta sub h equal to 0.269 inches. Um, what 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 e were you using to okay. obtain this deflection? Was it reduced? Yeah, yeah this is this, this is this deflection is calculated with a reduced e in this case. So 0.8 0.80. Point eight. Okay. Yeah, if you did, if you did it without the point eighty, you would multiply your deflection you got by one over point eight. You'd get the same number. Okay. And then um, we have one other question on this on this slide. And oh yeah, thank you. Um, we're looking for clarification of where, where the values come from for uh, for P story, and I'm going to assume their A means alpha. So could you go over that one more time? OK. So alpha here, we're, we're, uh, the load combination that I threw at you uh, is LRFD. So alpha is equal to 1. And then P story, if we go back, let's see if I can, there we go. So the, uh, the, the factored ultimate load, uh, on the roof is 4.05 kips per foot. And so uh, uh, when we brought that forward, the total gravity load supported by the frame is 4.05 kips per foot times the 40 foot width of the frame. OK. All right, um, and then one more question. Um, this example, you've got a you've got a, a lateral load at the at the at the top of the column. The question is, how would you account for a moment that is applied, say, for example, at the middle of the column? Uh, if there were a something that, uh, like a, a bracket there that it was applying a moment 
to the column? Yes. Yeah, if anything like that, we would basically uh, 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 we would model it. So if you say you have a bracket loading and some an extra load that comes in at the, at the intermediate column height, it goes into your analysis model. Uh, it's, you, you put it there. Whatever is physically there, you, you put it there. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's go back to, to section 4.6. That's slide 58. And we'll, uh, okay. we'll head, head to the finish line here. All right. Yeah. So let's uh, talk about general purpose second order analysis and a few accuracy considerations that uh, may be helpful. And so we're going to look at uh, three different commonly used methods. Uh, one uh, we call stability function based elements. The second, uh, cubic Hermitian elements, and the third being a p large delta element. Now, the uh, stability function-based element uh, basically shows up in a lot of stability textbooks. It's based on the analytical solution of the governing differential equations for a beam column member. The um, assumptions that go beyond that are behind it are basically elastic behavior, uh, prismatic member. Uh, or the Bernoulli kinematics, so no shear deformation, and uh, finite displacements, but uh, when we're looking at displacements or rotations relative to element chords, sine theta equals theta. Uh, the other elements uh, basically generally provide uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, better, easier mechanisms to generalize, to cover uh, various kinds of uh, things, such as shear deformation, uh, non-prismatic geometry, et cetera. And so, uh, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, most uh, software now uses other elements, but this is a good base to start from to talk, talk about a few things. And so uh, this uh, particular element, uh, we can, uh, I, we, it's derivable from uh, basic uh, slope deflection equations, if you wish, or uh, three by three matrix equations you see here for uh, uh, member forces, P, M, A, and M, B versus corresponding member deformations. The uh, shortening of the member E, uh, the deformations relative to the chord or rotations relative to the chord theta A, theta B. Uh, the terms SII and SIJ are what we call as stability coefficients. And uh, so those are these long, complicated trig expressions here. Uh, they, uh, those expressions depend on KL or kappa L, often is written that way, which is pi times square root of P over PE where P is pi squared e i star over L squared here. We can bring this forward into a global element, six degree of freedom, uh, for the planar analysis uh, by basically looking at uh, equilibrium and uh, kinematics of displacements, similar to some of the discussions Ron gave in, uh, in his lectures one and two. Uh, no time to kind of get into all that here, but this would be the, the, the global equations. Uh, that could be used uh, in, in a frame analysis with this element. Uh, what's uh, kind of more insightful is to look at what's going on with the stability coefficients as we increase axial load, axial load level. And so the horizontal axis here of this plot is P over PE, where again PE is pi squared e i star over L squared. Uh, the uh, vertical axis value of the stability functions or stability coefficients. And so what we have here is the stability coefficients are basically equal to 4 and 2 if we have something where the axial load is 0. However, if we start uh, increasing axial load in a beam column member, this elastic prismatic member basically ends up with a situation if we take, for example, where the axial load P is equal to the Euler load, PE, uh, the coefficients will now be 2.46 at both ends. So what was 4 and 2 and a carryover factor of 2, if you like to remember carryover factors, are now 2.46 for both and a carryover factor of 1. But things are tr changing rather dramatically as the axial load level is increasing. Overall, the stiffness of the member is, is, is tending to reduce but you can see there's some funky interaction effects between the moments of the two ends that are happening as well in terms of how things are changing. Uh, dashed lines show what happened with tensile load 
where we basically got some overall net tendency for increase in stiffness. Uh, now the cubic Hermitian element basically captures the same effects, and this is the element that Ron presented in his uh, lectures uh, one and two, and uh, then showed all the nice examples with in his session three. Uh, in this case, let's talk about uh, kind of the basic uh, elastic stiffness that we get that Ron showed earlier. And so if we look at, say, column five here of our six by six stiffness matrix, uh, column five is generally uh, all the forces at the degrees of freedom of the element, all the different degrees of freedom due to a unit displacement, in this case at degree of freedom five, which is U5 here, the transverse displacement at the right-hand end of the element. And uh, these different uh, coefficients here hopefully are familiar to many of you. Uh, the, the little less familiar uh, case is to look at the geometric stiffness. Uh, so this is the, pla the planar version of the element that Ron was showing you in Mastan. And so in this case, uh, this element basically gives us, uh, if we write out all these coefficients, these are the second order effects on the forces that are produced if we have a unit displacement at, at degree of freedom U5. All other displacements are uh, 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 fixed in the problem. Uh, and what you can see, uh, if you just work out then static equilibrium on the inset yellow box on the, at the bottom of the screen, you'll basically see, oh, wait a minute, we've got an extra moment there that's P times U5 that's showing up. Uh, if we write out equilibrium associated with all the forces coming out of column five of the geometric stiffness matrix, ah, well, that's basically balancing the P large delta effect at the element level here. Uh, again, uh, it's a second order analysis, so we're catching the, the equilibrium in the deflected geometry of our element here. Uh, now, it's important to recognize that the cubic element there, it's an approximation. It's basically a finite element approximation. And so, uh, generally, that, what does that mean? It be, anytime we're going down that road, it means, well, generally, you have to use enough elements so that, that the simple approximation, i.e., assuming a cubic displacement field for the element, is sufficiently representing what the real or physical structure is doing. Uh, so we need to come back and look at, well, how many elements do we use, need to use to make that work? Now, a simpler form of element, uh, that's a P large delta element that a number of programs use, uh, basically has the same elastic stiffness as the cubic Hermitian element, but the geometric stiffness is what you see here, which is basically a simpler version of the geometric stiffness that we were just looking at. And in this case, the uh, columns two and five of, of this element basically give us the, just the P large delta effect at the element level. And so any P small delta effect is not, at the element level, is no longer included in the element calculations. So not a problem. Well, here's an example. Uh, coming back to a nice cantilever column again, uh, if we take this uh, basic case, uh, uh, this problem is basically configured to give us a situation where if we uh, run the exact analytical solution for the element, uh, then the combination of axial force and moment for the loadings shown basically gives a unity check from the chapter H equations in AISC of 1.0. Uh, well, what happens if we have a P large delta analysis with only a single element? Uh, it turns out that the B1 equations that we were looking at earlier and where we uh, used, an, uh, we, we first basically derived equations that did not have an R sub M, or if we use an R sub M equal to one, that's the equivalent of a, a P large delta analysis with a single element in the beam column or column members. And so what we will get if we uh, basically use that B2 amplifier as an approximation to show what the P large delta element is doing here, we're going to get uh, an underestimate of 34% in the, 
in the side sway displacement. We'll get an underestimate of 24% in the moment. And our unity check will be off, will be underestimated by 9%. Now this is kind of a contrived example to kind of create a worst case effect, but there you have it. Uh, these are kind of the worst case effects that we could see in this problem. Okay, well, how do, how do we get around that? Well, if it's a p-large delta element, we basically just have to use enough elements per member. And uh, this uh, case shows an example with what, one, two, three, four, five, six elements. Uh, and what you can see is happening is that the small delta at the element level starts getting really tiny the more and more elements we use. And so uh, if you use enough elements, basically at the element level, p-large delta dominates which captures your P small delta at the member level. So how many elements do we need to make things work in general? Uh, we need uh, a criteria first to kind of set this up. And so the criteria that uh, uh, is discussed to some extent in the commentary to the IAC specification, Appendix 8, uh, and uh, it's criteria mentioned in AISC Design Guide 25, uh, we'd like to have uh, at least 5% accuracy in the member end displacements and internal member maximum nodal displacements. Uh, we'd like to have 5% accuracy in member end rotations. And when it gets down to calculating our internal forces, it would be nice to have uh, results that are within 3% accurate. Uh, now, uh, we don't necessarily have to get that accuracy for huge, huge, huge loads. Uh, let's suppose that we're looking at um, levels of load up to where the axial force in the member, alpha PR, at our strength load level that we're checking, uh, is uh, as much as 70% of the load at theoretical elastic buckling of whatever our structural system is. We'd like this to be able to work for any comprehensive range of member end conditions. Now, a couple of caveats that will go along with what I'd like to show you. One is that um, uh, if we're going to get this to work in general, uh, we're going to lose some accuracy if we don't go through the element internal moment calculation that I mentioned back in topic 4.3. Uh, so we need a good calculation of what's going on between the nodes. I gave you the procedure that I would recommend for software providers in that particular topic. Uh, the accuracy estimates. Uh, generally, in what, in what I'm going to show you here, are, are based on the best achievable theoretical solutions. Uh, and uh, they're, they're solutions based on essentially uh, kind of classifying different groups of cases and looking at, well, what's the worst case member boundary conditions that cause the largest error for a given category. So you could have uh, situations where the error is not as large as what you might expect from what I'm going to show you. Uh, the other thing that works on the flip side of things, though, is that uh, whenever we look at software implementation of this stuff, uh, we have solution algorithms, various implementation details uh, that can have some effect that degrade the accuracy from what we have for theoretical. Uh, and again, if, we're, if we have actual boundary conditions that aren't really the worst boundary conditions, again, that, that can help us out. Okay, so if all those caveats established, and if we, again, review our definitions of terms here, where I've been using script L for element length, in most of the cases, capital L for member length, and what we're going to be looking at here, and, and little s for spacing of the sampling points, uh, where we're looking at p small delta effects within the, any particular element. So what do we do if we have a stability function-based element? Well, it's based on uh, the exact analytical equations for the idealized case that it's set up for. So if that's what you got, one element per member is just fine. Thank you very much. And the element internal moments, uh, well, uh, again, we need to either determine them analytically, which can be very tricky. The equations are very complex, uh, have a lot of tr trigonometric terms. It's doable, but it's a, kind of a tough programming problem. Or you just go to the sampling procedure I, I discussed and uh, uh, you, uh, earlier in topic 4.3, and 
and, and sample it enough, a close enough interval to make sure you get a good accurate result between element ends. Uh, what if we have the cubic displacement based or cubic Hermitian element? So again, this is the element that, that Ron was showing you in MassTan. Other programs such as FastTrack, uh, ETABS, GT Strudel, Larsa, SAP, uh, RAM Elements, uh, I'll use uh, this element. Uh, at least uh, in certain parts of the calculations, you have to be careful with some approximations in some of the codes where they may be using p large delta approximations. You got to make sure that you you you're actually using what you're thinking you're using. Uh, what about if we have inloaded members where there's really little to no restraint of side sway? Uh, cubic Hermitian element generally does very well with one element per member. Uh, what if we've got some significant side sway restraint? Uh, generally, again, theoretically, you can get by with two elements per member and life is good. And if your axial load's rather small, so then you've got a case where, uh, say, uh, the axial load relative to pi squared i over uh, pi squared i star over um, L uh, squared, if that's less than 0.17, then one element should work just fine for a non-sway member as well. Now again, same deal. Uh, You've got to get a good calculation in general of what's going on between the nodes of the element. And so uh, the procedure I suggested earlier, or manual calculations, it would tend to be conservative to estimate those effects. Or uh, if particularly manually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a, I need to try to do some B1 equations on, on things. I'm not going to be very fond of that. I may prefer just to use enough elements, so P over PEL, uh, script L here, is less than 0.02 for all my members. I just hammer it with elements. Usually it doesn't take too many elements to get it down to this level, though. And so in this case, uh, then I don't have to worry about uh, the first order approximation for my uh, moments between the nodes. Now there is a, an exceptional case that relates to capabilities such as in MASTAN where we can use elements that represent uh, warping uh, stiffness, capture warping stiffness of the elements. And in general here, if we want the kind of accuracy that I was just pointing out, then uh, eight elements per member is a good idea within each unbraced length for if you're trying to, say, uh, analyze second order effects on a member and you're looking at a lateral torsional buckling problem, something of that sort. A lot of problems you might be able to get away with four elements, uh, but eight elements per member is uh, a fairly assured solution that things will work well. All right, what about P large delta elements? I always put here, see the previous slide for cubic elements because my students will often take this and then apply this slide to cubic Hermitian elements. Uh, well, with a P large delta element, generally many more elements are required. And uh, this is a chart that comes from recommendations in Design Guide 25. And basically what you do is you come in on the uh, horizontal axis from below, what's your uh, level of axial load, alpha PR, in your, struct, in your, in your member versus the uh, PL equals to pi squared e i star over L squared. Uh, and say, for example, uh, let's say I have a alpha P over PL of 0.2. Uh, and so then if that's the case, I'm going to be really out of luck if that's a sway or a simply supported base or a cantilever because I'm going to kind of be blowing things out of the water. That structure's not going to work. Uh, if I have what's shown by the red bars here, a sway case with top and bottom restraint, then I basically come up and I hit the red bar first, and so I say, okay, I need two elements, two P large delta elements there for that. Uh, if I have a non-sway case, then I'm slightly missing the green bar for two elements. I need to use three elements per member to make that case work. There is a, uh, a, a basically an out that's explained in the commentary to AISC. It's easily explained in the context of using the B2 equation with and without 
the R sub M factor, which remember accounts for P small delta effects on the large delta. Uh, and so if we, again, use a B2 with RM equals 1, it's essentially doing a P large delta analysis. If we use a B2 with R sub M based on some calculated value, it gives us a conservative representation of the P small delta effects on the uh, drift, the large delta in our structure. And so what the commentary basically points out is that if uh, your ratio of the load supported by your moment frame columns, PMF, divided by your total story load supported by everything is less than uh, one-third, which uh, for many steel building frames is often the case because we will often have a lot of gravity framing and leaning columns in a steel structural building frame. And also if your uh, side sway amplifier B2 is less than or equal to 1.7, then if we work everything through here and look at the error that we would get by not including R sub M for this case versus including R sub M, and remember R sub M is kind of a conservative representation of the P small delta effects, uh, we can see that uh, there are errors, uh, the largest error we could expect would be about 4%. So not bad. This is a good argument to basically point out that uh, many steel building frames, the overall side sway, uh, amplification effects are dominated by P large delta, and it really doesn't require uh, much more than a P large delta solution for those to, uh, to work well. P small delta is a, an, another deal. Okay, let's look at one last thing. Uh, I've kind of focused for simplicity mostly on looking at uh, things that are planar in the discussions. Obviously, a three-dimensional element, you've got two different planar directions to worry about. But what about a three-dimensional element, uh, three-dimensional analysis where we're dealing with uh, some torsional uh, issues? Uh, and uh, the problem that can come up in certain cases is that um, uh, if uh, let's look, look at our torsional stiffness due to restraint of warping and what our typical frame elements in most design software are using. Uh, most elements in practice uh, are 12 degree of freedom, three-dimensional elements. And the torsional term, torsional stiffness term for these elements is simply GJ over L. Well, if you went to chapter F and you tried to design a, an I-section beam, and you say, okay, well, I'm going to neglect ECW. I'm only going to look at GJ and use that. You'd find that you could hardly get anything to work because GJ is very small. All right, let's look at an example here. If we just take a cantilever and uh, this uh, uh, warping stiffness, it basically another way of looking at it or thinking about it is the cross-bending stiffness of the flanges in a case like this. And so well, this looks pretty tame. W14 by 22 with a 10-foot length. And just look at a first-order elastic solution where we're going to subject it to a torque at its end. Uh, now the uh, equations including the warping contribution to the stiffness basically give you a rotation angle at the end of 0.052 radians here. If we do an analysis of this member with the typical 12 degree of freedom element, which only includes GJ, uh, and then this, the P is just TL over GJ, we've essentially doubled our uh, rotation, our twist rotation at the end, or we're only looking using at about half the stiffness that we really have in this member. Now, where that can come in and kind of fool us and burn us sometimes, yeah, let's take this W14 by 22, and let's suppose that uh, we uh, we're looking at a model, and uh, we it's a, 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 a Member that's simply simply supported at its ends flexually and torsionally, and so all the k factors would be one. The unbraced length here, LB, is essentially the L sub R, so the transition from inelastic to elastic lateral torsional buckling. And uh, let's look at uh, at analyses of this as a beam column. What will happen here in this case is if you if you try to set this up in say mastan uh, without 
the warping or any other uh, good program that has 12 degrees of freedom and uh, can uh, do a three-dimensional second-order analysis. Uh, and you follow the uh, points that I've made here, and you use enough elements here along this, out, this member to make sure things are accurate. Uh, you can actually get the program predicting internally with just a GJ over L stiffness the red curve I show here. So basically, the, you're going to get a situation where the program is going berserk, and you're getting really large displacements as you're approaching the red curve. Whereas a designer, you're looking at the blue curve here. That's actually the, des the design strength I'm allowed to use. Wait a minute. What's wrong with this program? It's, it, it's the, the solution is going berserk on me, and I haven't gotten to my uh, design load here yet. Now, the problem is that your internal representation of your member is only counting on GJ over L as the torsional stiffness. And you run that as an accurate second order analysis, guess what? It has very little torsional uh, uh, stability. How can we fix that? Well, when we've got open section members like this, where if you've got a problem where the members in, where you're indicating buckling at small load levels because of leaving out ECW, uh, one option is to consider using a larger effective member GJ. Uh, one of the software packages out there, RESA 3D, has an option that allows you to do this. Uh, it's an option where the, the approximation assumes warping fixed at the ends of the members. Uh, we also use that approximation as a recommendation for a simplified grid analysis and curved and skewed bridges, curved and skewed eye girder bridges, where if you leave, uh, if you just analyze those of the GJ, you get some crazy results in terms of the uh, deflections of these uh, uh, curved and skewed structures. So Ashto gives some explicit recommendations for using such an effective GJ uh, in, uh, if, you, if you go to the Ashto uh, design provisions. The other thing would be, OK, uh, Ron pointed out that there are some programs other than MassTan that actually model the warping. Unfortunately, those are mostly still uh, general purpose fine element codes, uh, codes like ANSYS, Abacus, Strand. Uh, but I think we're getting there, and, and, and uh, I, th I think as we recognize uh, the importance of some of these things. Hopefully, uh, if uh, the software providers can write more gaming software to get some do some revenue, they can implement uh, some of these things for us so we can do a better job with the um, uh, second order uh, structural analysis. Uh, Brent, that's it. Uh, everyone, I appreciate your attendance. And we'll try to take some more questions now if, uh, if there are any. Okay, thank you very much, Don. Uh, we do have a few more questions, and just encourage anyone, if you do have a question, to feel free to type that into the chat feature at the uh, left-hand side of your screen. Uh, the first question we want to take is back to slide 44. Okay. Okay, so your slide states that K equals 1 for all leading topics. Mm -hmm. The question is this. Shouldn't K equal infinity for a leaning column ah. in the side swimmer? Okay. So actually, uh, that, capacity, yeah. should that be zero in a side, side sway mode for linear columns? Okay. In terms of the side sway response of the structure, that is correct. But uh, you, you don't want to design that member for K equals infinity. What's happening is your moment frame or whatever other lateral load resisting system you have when you have a leaning column is providing side sway restraint. And that's what makes the member stable. So given the idealization that we, uh, for a leaning column where we have pins at each end, that member is depending on its side sway stability by leaning on everything else. But then when it comes to buckling, you've got two buckling solutions. One is the side sway buckling of the overall structure. But that's a buckling where the leaning columns tend to destabilize the structure. Uh, when we look at a k-factor for the leaning column, though, we're talking about, hey, what uh, k-factor do I want to use to design that member? So there I'm, I'm saying, hey, the other lateral load resisting framing is resisting or is bracing 
the tops and bottom of my column. It's pinned at the tops and bottoms, so K is 1. That makes sense. Okay. Let's go to slide 72. Okay, so um, I'm on your second, your blue, second blue uh, bullet point, mm -hmm. and in the second subscript, it says one element is sufficient if p over p e l is less than 0 0.17. Okay, so at that point, you use p sub e capital L, and on the next, the next bullet point, the black yes. one, it says lowercase l. Can you explain the difference between these two? Okay, very good. Uh, that's intentional here. When I'm using capital L, we're talking about something that's a check at the member level. So I'm looking at my member length. And so if P over my member length is less than or equal to 0.17, then I'm, I'm comfortable with using one element to represent that member. Uh, where we see P over P, P script L below, what that is looking at is, uh, what I, the way I'm posing it here is uh, I'm basically saying, hey, I don't want to have to do this uh, extra calculations between the nodes. Is there a way I can get away with that without having to do that? Uh, well, and, and a lot of software packages out there will not include any piecemeal delta effects between the nodes. They only give you the first order effects between the nodes. They don't give you the P times delta second. I want to basically still get, uh, make sure I'm going to get good results that I can run with for my design there for that case. I, I will use enough elements so that P over PE script L, L script L being the element length, is less than or equal to 0.02. Okay. Um, okay. This person's is asking kind of for a, I guess a, a big picture. The question is kind of big picture, but can you can you give a a, a brief summary or explanation once again of, of the difference between p small delta and p large delta? Okay. Uh, so uh, p large delta is based on the uh, p acting through the displacements relative to the ends of the member or relative to the ends of the segment that you're looking at. So it could be a P large delta on the member level, so you're talking about P times the large delta of the member ends, or it could be a P large delta at the segment or element level, so you take whatever the length of that segment or element is. Uh, P small delta is then what we look at when we uh, consider uh, the, the fact that the member has bending moment in it, and so it's curved under the uh, deflected curve. And so that curvature basically means we have a deviation from the straight cord between the ends of the member or the ends of the segment that we're looking at. And so P acting through that displacement relative to the cord gives us an additional moment <coughs> excuse me, effect. Uh, uh, that uh, causes extra curvature, causes extra deflection. Okay. And then how do these relate to the B1, B2 that we were, we were reviewing earlier in the session? Okay, very good. So um, uh, the B, when we're calculating B1, when we were looking at B1 and its uses in the uh, essentially topics 4.1 and 4.2, we're focusing entirely on P small delta uh, uh, approximations there. Uh, when we looked at, at B2 in, uh, in, in topics 4.4 uh, four, four and, 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 and afterwards, there B2 focuses on P large delta effects, but remember we have this R sub M which gives us an approximation for the fact that if, hey, if our columns are bending, we're getting some extra moment, P times small delta, that then increases the moments in the columns, increases the curvature in the columns, increases the side sway deflection. And so B2 is, is a P large delta amplifier, 
but it includes an influence of P small delta on the large delta uh, through the R sub M factor as well. Okay. Uh, next question. When multiple moment frames are present on the same floor, is the P story load distributed based on the tributary lateral load to the frame? Uh -huh. Interesting question. The, uh, yeah, I think if, if you have essentially something where you can where the structure is working, uh, the, the diaphragm is working as a rigid diaphragm, uh, you would basically look to distribute it based on stiffness. Uh, if you have something that's a flexible diaphragm, then usually we make the approximation that uh, the tributary uh, loads would distribute to each of the frames. Okay. Uh, let's go to slide 52. So I guess really the, the, this is in reference to slides 52 and 53. You look at a couple different uh, methods in comparing to uh, to getting an exact uh, uh, determining the exact moment on the on the frame. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the first question is: Are these methods allowed by AISC? And how do we know how do we know if, if it's or, or why are they so inaccurate in some of these examples you showed? Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, good question. Uh, both of these methods, if we have a, a, a frame that has negligible side sway under gravity load, they'll work. And uh, so, in, in the limit where the side sway deflections under gravity loads are are small, then we're okay. Uh, the example I'm showing is a relatively extreme example to make the point that you can get yourself into big trouble using these approximations when uh, you have a structure that has significant side sway under gravity load. So the NT LT method basically gets things right here with that, but it, it achieves the correct result via the re reverse of the reaction from the NT analysis being applied to an L in the LT solution. The amplified story drift method gets it right because we just focus on, wait a minute, what's the, what's the first order story drift? Now let's amplify it. Now let's get an HP delta and it's essentially doing a traditional P large delta analysis but with an amplified delta. Uh, and so both of those methods uh, basically cover the bases more generally. Uh, these two methods where I gave the big red X on them are methods that are very convenient if you've got negligible side sway deflection under gravity load, but you always need to be wary of uh, any sort of situation where you, you're, you get some significant side sway under gravity load, you're going to have some errors. Okay. Thank you very much, Don, and uh, thank you all for um, your questions, we do have a couple more, Don, that we will not be able to get to tonight, but um, I'll follow up with you and we'll, uh, we'll get those answers out to you that okay. did not get Very your good. question answered this night. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.